Hello, everybody. We're just going to give the room a minute to fill up and we'll be starting shortly. Okay, it looks like we're starting to level out here. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, thanks for joining us tonight, everybody. My name is Mallory Clark Sokolov. I'm a senior planner with City Planning. I'm joined by my colleagues, Liz Oper and Maggie O'Neill, as well as a couple uh, of the members of the Embankment Preservation Coalition. So you should see Sean, Stephen, and Maureen on your screens. Um, we're happy to kind of give you an update on where the plan is at tonight and um, have another conversation about this very exciting process, project. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and go through a presentation. And then um, I'll take you through an agenda so we kind of understand what the meeting's gonna do. Okay. So this is uh, our second meeting for the Sixth Street Embankment Redevelopment Plan. Um, tonight, we're going to go through a couple of things. We're going to review the approach to the overall um, project and how we're handling this from a planning perspective, which is really specific to the land use in this area. We're going to do a very quick plan overview, just a refresher of some of the things we talked about at our last meeting for those of you who might be joining for the first time tonight. And um, again, I'm not going to repeat that meeting. That meeting is recorded and posted on the city's data portal. Um, so you do have the ability to view that, but we'll just kind of give you a crash course in, in the high level um, objectives we talked about last time. We're also going to update you on zone two of the plan, which is our mixed use mid rise development district. I'm going to then pass it over to Maggie O'Neill from Historic Preservation to go over some of the historic preservation guidelines in the plan. Maggie will then pass it over to Sean Gallagher from the Embankment Preservation Coalition, who will go over their vision for um, the embankment open space, they've been working on that with the community for many years, so I'm sure a lot of you are familiar. And then we'll circle back and go through zone one of the plan, which is uh, the open space zone of the plan. And then we'll wrap it up with a couple poll questions and some general Q&A and discussion at the end. Uh, Mallory, uh, if you'd like to share your screen. Oh, it was shared. Hold on one second. Sure. Let me... Uh that one more time. <laughs> okay, share screen. All right, you can all see now? Yeah, we have it. It's um, perfect. If you hit full screen. Yep. Perfect. Got it. All right. So really quick, this was just the visual I was uh, talking through, but got a couple different chapters to get through tonight. We've got a lot of information just like last time. So we're going to move as quickly as possible, but make sure um, everyone has a good understanding of what's in the draft redevelopment plan as of date. Um, so general approach, there's a bigger update to what we talked about in the last meeting as to how we were handling the project in general. Um, and one of the big shifts is last time we spoke with you all, we talked about how there is a portion of this, the overall embankment, which is comprised of eight blocks that exists in a redevelopment plan already in the city. So that's block one, which is the um, easternmost block, which sits between Marin Boulevard and Manila Avenue. And that um, block is actually currently zoned within the Luis Munoz Marin Boulevard redevelopment plan. The original approach was to pull this block out of that plan and put it into the new embankment redevelopment plan. Um, since our last meeting, we uh, did look, look at uh, the plan a little bit more in depth and realized that some of the things that we discussed would trigger uh, the city's inclusionary zoning ordinance. And the development team basically relayed that um, they no longer would be able to have a viable project under the zoning we were talking about 
with the affordable housing contribution in addition to the other contributions that they were making. And so since our last meeting, the developer for block one has chosen to uh, utilize their existing zoning rights within their existing uh, redevelopment plan. So basically block one is now pulled out of the embankment redevelopment plan. It will remain in the um, Lewis Marin redevelopment plan and they will utilize their existing zoning rights. So I'll get into a little bit more detail what that means for the project in a second. Um, but just to understand that the zoning that they will be utilizing in that plan is still subject to a settlement agreement between all of the parties of the ongoing litigation for this matter. So if you recall, there's a lot of a long legal history to this project and um, that that component isn't changing. So the, the, the whole project, any form of the project for block one and the embankment redevelopment plan, which is now blocks two through eight, um, are contingent upon the transfer of the ownership of blocks two through eight to the city. So the city will still take ownership of the open space and that has to happen before the developer of block one can utilize any form of zoning on that block other than deferring to um, R4 zoning within the city. So what does that mean in terms of what the project actually looks like and how you as the community will experience uh, the project on block one? Um, so last time we met with you, we were talking about a max density of 875 units on that block and an undefined amount of hotel rooms. Um, in, in pursuing their existing zoning rights under the, the Lewis Marin plan, the developer will be um, capped at 400 units, which is what is written into the plan today, and 200 hotel rooms. So we're talking about less than half the units that we were talking about last time and a capped hotel use that was previously undefined. In terms of FAR, um, we did not have a standard in the, the draft plan we discussed last time. We were controlling the tower elements through maximum diagonal distances of the tower across the towers but the existing zoning in the Marin plan does have a maximum FAR. So this is the ultimate control over how they're able to develop the site. That FAR that exists in the plan today is not being changed in any way. Um, and so they are subject to the, the FAR. Maximum height, last time we were talking to you all about um, two alternatives for the development on block one. One of which was born um, really out of the term sheet. If you remember, there was a couple conversations about the, the legal uh, logistics of the project. And there was a, a, an agreed upon term sheet, which had set a vision for two towers on the block. One that would be um, fronting more onto Manila Avenue, and that would be a little bit shorter at 35 stories. One that would be fronting toward uh, Marin Boulevard, which would be a little bit taller at 45 stories. And then we also introduced um, the idea of allowing the developer to pursue a path of just one tower on the block. So it would be um, shifting the tower more towards the Marin Boulevard and allowing them to increase that height to 55 stories. And we did do a poll in the last meeting. There was uh, majority support for the vision of including a one tower scheme. Um, and so then what does that mean in terms of how the project would move forward under the existing plan? The existing plan does have that same um, language of permitting two towers, one at 35 stories and one at 45 stories. So the major change that would be happening to this plan is really just an urban design change from the development standpoint, which would allow them to still pursue the one story, the one tower scheme at a maximum of 45 stories. So they wouldn't be increasing the permitted height. They would just be able to combine the footprint of those two towers to develop it as one tower. And then the other urban form components that we discussed previously still hold true. So the project would still be composed of a podium base for parking um, with towers above that are required to meet certain setbacks. And there would still be a 30 foot public right of way on top of that podium base. So if you look at the map on the right, this is the existing district map for the Marin Boulevard plan. So district two is specific to block one that we're discussing right now. And as I said, um, it is to remain, we're really just making that urban design change to allow them to go from the one tower, uh, the two tower scheme, sorry, to the one tower scheme. 
And then just a quick refresher of what that means in terms of form in a way that's a little more visual. Um, so this, the project will be composed of a parking base uh, that, that really is um, built up from the street level. It will include a 30 foot wide public right of way, which we refer to as the embankment right of way and that will abut the Northern property line. And then it will also have a base roof deck, which um, can be used for amenity, utilized for amenities, either private or public. And above that, there will be a tower. So the change here is that we're permitting them to go from the two separate towers to the one joint tower. And we're capping the height at the existing cap of 45 stories. In terms of the overall bulk, um, the plan today, if you look at this table at the bottom of the screen, allows for each tower to have a dimension of 105 feet in length by 75 feet in depth. Um, so the new language will allow the one tower at 210 feet in depth, which is the 105 and the 105 combined. So it's the same footprint that was envisioned with the two towers um, and still the 75 foot depth. It's just basically that those two masses are allowed to, to kind of combine into one. And um, ultimately, this is still controlled by the maximum FAR within the plan. So they might not get to build that entire bulk out and still be compliant with the FAR. The FAR will control their cap. It just gives flexibility for them to decide to do a lower building that's a little longer or a more narrow building that's a little taller. But like I said, the, the maximum caps in terms of height and FAR have not changed since um, or will not change from what is adopted today. And um, as previously stated as well, they will still have to have minimum step backs from the Marin frontage, the Manila frontage, and the Southern property line, which abuts some uh, lower, lower rise housing. Um, and then in terms of developer contributions, what does that mean for, for block one based on what we discussed last time? Sorry, one second, I'm gonna take a quick sip of water here. Um, so, as I've stated, there will still be a 30 foot public uh, walkway, including a public access easement on block one along the Northern property line known as the embankment right away. Uh, there will still be a staircase built providing access to that elevated walkway. And that will come from the Marin frontage. Um, there will still be a bicycle channel adjacent to that staircase so that bikes aren't um, forced to take an elevator, they will have the option. There's still a requirement for decorative, decorative screening and enclosure of the parking level. So the parking will not be visible from the embankment level. Um, and there is still the requirement of a construction of a bridge that is a minimum of 15 feet wide to block two. So this will be a bridge spanning from uh, block one across Manila Avenue to block two of the embankment park. And they are still obligated to provide handicap access and that will be provided um, simultaneously with the first phase of site development. The major shift here is that because the developer is no longer seeking additional zoning rights and they're utilizing their uh, current zoning, that there is no longer a contribution of part of block two improvements. So last time we met, the, that developer of block one was going to be building out block two um, of the park and that's no longer part of the conversation. Okay, so moving on to block one, I just kind of wanted to recap some of the feedback we got from the last meeting and um, you know how we're responding or what we've considered since then. There were some questions raised about why not look at having the um, block one public right away on the south side of the block as opposed to the north side. And we did talk about this with both um, the embankment coalition with the developer and we looked into um, some high level feasibility and really it was determined that there is a vision really embedded in this plan and embedded in the conversations around the embankment for many years now of the potential to integrate light rail or trolley in the future and running um, that this right of way on the south side of block one would prevent that from ever being able to continue across Marin Boulevard just based on property ownership and um, approvals that we have for future development or pending approvals that we have for future development. Um, there's zoning in the adjacent redevelopment plan that allows a building directly across the street at Marin uh, in a way where the, the 
transit system would not be able to carry across and continue. And so we felt for a long-term visioning, it was uh, most important really to preserve the ability to continue that down the line. Um, and so the, the decision was made to keep that right of way on the north side of the block. Um, we heard a lot of support for the idea of this park being a, a more natural space for the city, a lot of support for um, a lot of the principles of the Embankment Preservation Coalition's vision um, and how the open space is built out in the future in terms of blocks two through eight. And um, we did hear some concerns about, you know, the heights we were discussing for development in block one and the intensity and the number of units. And I think, you know, we kind of just covered how a lot of that is being lessened from what we talked about last time. We're, we're sticking with the existing maximum height that the developers permitted today and the existing number of units, which is less than half of the maximum units we we're talking about last time. Okay, so moving on from block one and really what uh, what we're gonna be talking about now is, is the separate redevelopment plan, which is the Sixth Street Embankment Redevelopment Plan. So just a quick overview of some of the principles here, and then we'll get into um, some of the standards a little more specifically. So we have adjusted the boundary of this plan from our last conversation. As I said, you can see um, there's kind of an outlier block here, which is block one, which is no longer within this redevelopment plan and will remain in the current. So our boundary now consists of blocks two through eight. Um, and then just some of the language we covered last time in case you're joining us for the first time tonight, I just wanna make sure you can follow along with the conversation. Um, what is the embankment structure? So you'll hear us refer to the structure, the structure, the structure. Some people aren't exactly sure what that means. And really what we just mean is the stone structures that housed the um, elevated rail previously. So if, if you're familiar with the area, you're familiar with the very tall, impressive um, stone structures. They run from blocks two through uh, six in the plan. And um, that's what whenever we say embankment structure, we're referring to that structure. And then similarly, you'll hear us use the word stanchion in the plan. Um, and what is that? So this is uh, specific to block seven and eight. And these are these remaining kind of footprints. You can see, I'm just gonna toggle here. Um, they, they were trestles that um, previously supported an elevated continuation of the rail line. That elevated portion has been removed, but those trestles exist and those will remain. Okay, so hopefully you can follow along with some of the vocab we use in the plan and be a little bit more clear on what we're talking about. All right, moving on, looking at the boundary map. Um, so this is just a map version of the aerial I just discussed with you. We have blocks two through eight. These, this is just what that means from a tax map perspective. So more logically, how you can follow along is blocks two through eight. So it starts on the Eastern side, fronting Manila, moves West across Newark Avenue and block eight abuts Mary Benson Park. And then general purposes of the plan. So essentially the, the baseline objective of the plan is to protect the historic asset of the embankment structures and trestles and increase access to open space for residents of the city through creating a continuous publicly accessible right away for bicycle and pedestrian use. So that's the primary objective of why this redevelopment plan is being written, why um, you know the litigation exists and um, really what, what we're here to talk about. So some of the objectives that help support the purpose of the plan to preserve and rehabilitate the embankment structures on block two through six. So those are those big structures I just reviewed with you all. They exist on blocks two through six. Um, we do want to preserve those and we want to rehabilitate them and we want to ensure their structural integrity moving forward. To preserve the remaining embankment stanchions. Um, so these are less, you know, we're less, uh, concerned about the idea of structural stability in the sense that they're not supporting anything anymore, but we want to keep these remaining um, stanchions as intact as possible and really integrate them into the future open space. Uh, to adaptively reuse the embankment structures on blocks two through six through the development of an open space and trail system for public use rooted in ecological conservation and passive and active recreational programming. 
Uh, similarly, we want to reestablish the Harzmas branch right of way. So that's the right of way that was formerly the rail right of way. Um, and that will just kind of be reimagined as a, an open space trail right of way, as opposed to something that's used for freight rail. And then wherever possible to preserve and enhance the established natural environment and flora that has become naturally seeded ecological corridors. So I think Sean is going to cover a lot about how the embankment has really documented and built a vision around the preservation of this uh, unique open space. And so we did embed you know, the objective of keeping this natural environment in, in the plan language continuously. And then, um, you know, one of the main goals for the city as well is to really es establish this corridor as a critical bicycle and pedestrian connection. Um, we see as a huge opportunity to connect to some larger regional networks such as um, the East Coast Greenway and the Hudson Essex Greenway. There are some, you know, major um, bike and pedestrian routes coming online down the road and envisioned across the state. And this is a great opportunity to plug into some of those larger networks. And then lastly, um, we are looking to redevelop the plan in a way that will allow for a residential mixed use development on a portion of block seven, which we'll review in a minute. So in terms of the zoning, the plan is broken up into two districts now. So last time we spoke with you all, we were looking at three districts because block one was a district. Since that has been removed, we now have just two districts in the plan. Zone one being the Harzmas Branch Corridor District, which is the open space and trail network I just talked about in the objectives. And then zone two is the mixed rise uh, mixed use mid-rise district, which I just explained uh, was the one kind of infill project. And this is just an aerial, so you can you can see that um, the, the mixed use mid-rise district exists on the block between Brunswick Street and Division Street and is currently mostly comprised of surface parking and a um, auto facility at the corner of Division Street there. So this is, uh, we're not removing existing embankment infrastructure for that development, it will be worked around any remaining stanchions. And then um, just kind of a land dedication map. So anything in green here is property that's to be de dedicated to the city as open space. So again, the zoning on block one in the other plan is contingent upon that dedication. And then just um, for clarity that there will still be the public access easement for the elevated walkway on block one. Okay, and then just a quick update on zone two, which is that mixed use mid rise development district. Um, so nothing significant has changed from the last time we presented this zone to you. Uh, we're still looking at one project for infill. Uh, the only major shift in what is happening here is that there is now an affordable component to the project. So this project will be subject to the city's inclusionary zoning ordinance which means the developer will have a 15% on-site affordable contribution. So 15% of the total units will have to be affordable based on the city's inclusionary zoning ordinance standards. So what that means, um, similar to last time, like I said, not, not much has changed in terms of the development itself. The, the block will be subdivided into two lots, lot 2.1, is where the development will occur. And then lot 1.1 is where the city will take ownership um, for the open space corridor. The project will still be six stories and 72 feet in height as a maximum. And it will not require any setbacks from these lot lines. So they can build lot line to lot line in the lot that's created through the subdivision. Um, the only major change is we did hear some feedback at the last meeting that uh, you know, we had this requirement from the remaining stanchion that sits at the border of Division Street. So that little black rectangle here kind of denotes that stanchion that exists. And the way that the plan was being built was uh, requiring a minimum six foot offset from that stanchion to where the lot could be created. And there was some concern that the six feet um, was pretty narrow. So we did a site visit, we did some measuring and essentially, um, it's tight, it's very tight in this corner. Um, I measured a little bit over seven feet between um, the, the property line of the lot that would be created and the stanchion. 
Um, but one thing that we did know is that the sidewalk is pretty wide as exists here, it's 15 feet. And so what we're doing is removing this minimum 15 foot requirement and allowing that to be flexible. And then the city will work with the Division of Engineering moving forward to see if maybe we could get another foot or two out of that sidewalk. So maybe we only reduce that sidewalk to about 12 feet, um, which is still a very comfortable sidewalk. It's a sidewalk that a dimension that exists in many parts of the city. And that might allow us to shift the property lines a little bit to give a little more breathing room between the stanchion and the property line of the new development. But we're keeping that minimum six feet. So we're ensuring the absolute extreme case will be six feet. Um, but we, we think that there'll be a, an opportunity to work uh, with engineering and work with the developer to potentially open up a couple more feet. It's just something that we um, will need to do in the field and will require more intense surveying. So it's not something we do at the plan level. Okay, so I'm gonna give myself a little bit of a break here and pass it over to Maggie O'Neill from Historic Preservation to review some of the standards and guidelines uh, specific to preservation objectives. Great, thanks, Mel. Um, so for historic preservation guidelines, I'm actually going to discuss uh, the guidelines in both plans, so both the Lewis Marin plan, as well as the Six Street Embankment plan. Because since the developer is opting to go with their existing zoning, it's important to review the preservation guidelines that we have in place in that plan, as well as the new ones that we're establishing within the street plan. Mel, if you want to go to the next slide. Okay. So in the Lewis Marin plan, um, our guiding principle is to retain the most intact existing historic fabric. So block one of the pavement structure has the least amount of existing historic fabric remaining. When we talk about historic fabric, we're really talking about that historic embankment structure, those stones. The condition of some of the stones on this block is failing. They, um, it, like I said, it's the least intact on the uh, Marin Boulevard side, which is the photo below, you can kind of see they're, they're sagging, they're not necessarily structurally safe. There have been intrusions with other types of materials such as concrete which causes harm to the stones and there's just really not as many intact. Whereas on the Manila side of block one, you do have a full turn of both corners, you have much more intact there, uh, much more intact embankment structure there. So within this plan, the standards that are in here um, provide more protection to that corner, those two corner wraps facing Manila than they do to the Marin Boulevard side. Um, that isn't, the way that uh, preservation standards are written here is to be a little bit more flexible to accommodate the development. And then that side that is closer to blocks two through six acts as a visual transition to the remainder of the embankment structure. Um, block one through six, all list locally listed as landmarks within Jersey City, which means the New Jersey City Historic Preservation Commission and its staff have review and approval over all work proposed on block one as well as blocks two through six. Um, all of the work um, is outlined to be guided by the Secretary of the Interior Standards for the Treatment of Historic Properties. That is the National Park Service guidelines for generally for all historic preservation projects in the country. They're super in depth, they cover a wide variety of materials and it's a really good foundation for us to work off of. They'll also be guided by the city's historic design standards. Um, we also have a quite strong uh, historic preservation ordinance that makes uh, uh, many recommendations for new construction and how to really treat existing historic materials. Um, and then the National Park Service also has available preservation briefs, which are updated periodically to guide anyone working on historic fabric on the appropriate ways to treat those. So all of those are included as reference materials in this plan to make sure that we preserve the remaining embankment structures on top one. So like I said, for the historic materials, this really focuses on the restoration of the embankment stones that are in the best shape and also to protect them from any adverse effects of the proposed development. So there are uh, selective demolition of some embankment stones on this block. Like I said, they're the ones that face the Marin Boulevard side. We also provide some guidance on appropriate materials that directly abut the remaining historic fabric. So on, on that visual transition from block one to two to three to four, um, there will be guide, there are guidelines for materials that are most appropriate that will go right up against those embankment stones. 
So we're providing guidance on things like if, um, like suggest masonry is an appropriate material, whereas things like a wood clapboard or EFIS, things like that are not considered appropriate to be right up against those historic stones. Again, we really wanna take the best care of them that we can. We also have some production standards for new elements that are on block one. Um, so like we had said that right of way uh, and that bridge are the most important to us. We also did include guidelines for stairs. Um, most important thing for these new elements is that they are of a modern design, which may seem a little um, out of place within historic standards, but it's actually really important historically to differentiate the, the old from the new. And in this case, we don't want there to be any confusion that there may have, that these were the original bridges connecting the blocks. And we also don't want there to be any confusion that there were historically stairs going up to the embankment. So regarding those bridges, the design of them is uh, to be a modern design. Of course, they can visually refer to some of the historic elements of historic trusses, that cross facing, things like that. If there are wonderful elements incorporated of that, that's absolutely acceptable. We encourage things like that, but we're really not looking for a reconstruction of what was there originally. So now if you want to go to block the next. So within the six segment, uh, redevelopment, so this is blocks two through six, we have a, another set of historic preservation guidelines. Um, blocks two through six have the most intact historic embankment, embankment structure. So this plan, we are looking strictly at restoring and rotating the structure. And we are not uh, proposing or recommending any type of demolition of any of the embankment blocks on two through six. Um, there may be a small uh, selective demolition to incorporate those bridges going across, but that'll be done at the time of HPC staff. Really within blocks two through six, the preservation standards are more geared towards honoring the new natural use of the embankment and rehabilitating or restoring the embankment structure in order to incorporate the park and open space use. Um, similarly to block one, all of the work in this, uh, these blocks will be guided by the Secretary of Interior Standards, the city's historic preservation ordinance, um, preservation brief, national parks. Uh, Maggie, really quick, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you're yeah. getting a, a little glitchy. Would you be able to just turn off your camera? Maybe that'll yeah. make your bandwidth a little better. Awesome. Now, where do you want me to start by? Start back. Uh, I could, I could still hear you. It was just starting to get a little fuzzy. So I wanted to. All good. Um, Similarly to block one, uh, there will be JCHPC review on anything proposed for blocks two through six as well. The preservation standards for the historic materials, so the historic embankment structures on blocks two through six, um, the plan required the historic embankment structure be restored and rehabilitated. And similarly, there's also protections against any adverse effects as a result of development. Development in this case means the of open space and trail system. Um, we provide guidance on any materials that abut the remaining historic fabric. And here again, we're looking at those new bridges across, um, new stairs, things like that. Uh, similarly, we are recommending uh, materials that visually would have been historically appropriate um, and are of a high quality. For uh, new elements that are going on here, the preservation standard, and we're calling that modern design. We really don't want there to be any confusion that these were the original bridges. Um, we want them to look modern. We want them to be modern. Um, we, the reconstruction or copying of anything that was there historically is not permitted under these guidelines. It's really not appropriate. Same this for any stairs or elevators that would be going up from the street level to the top of the embankment for access to the park. We want those to be of a modern design. Um, and then we also have some minimal, but some guidance for any new structures to support the new use of the site. So any small areas within the park that um, require shelter, such as uh, small stands for water, things like that, um, should also be of a modern design, but be designed in context, right? We were looking to support the natural use of the site. So we want these structures to be designed in context, something that you would see in an open space environment. Um, and something that also is designed and cited on the in, in a way reduces and preferably eliminates their visibility from the public way. Uh, that means that when you're looking on the street, the first thing that you see 
on blocks two through six is not going to be a small stand where you can buy water. It's going to be geared towards the natural flora and fauna that is uh, existing on the embankment. Um, and then the last element of the preservation standards for these new elements is that any new bridges, stairs, and structures need to be designed in a way that's removable. Um, this language is taken from the Secretary of the Interior for Rehabilitation. The goal here is not that they will be removed. It's just that if something were to happen and we needed to remove all of these, removing them would not cause adverse effect to the historic embankment structure. So we wouldn't be causing harm by removing a bridge or removing a staircase, things like that, from the historic embankment structure. And our goal here is to we know the good that we have here and we want to keep it that way. We are looking to minimize any harm to this embankment structure and we're looking to just preserve it as best we can. Uh, that covers all of the preservation guidelines. So I believe Sean is up next. Great. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Mallory. Thanks, Mallory and Maggie. Um, so this redevelopment plan is really about 95% about green infrastructure. It's, um, it's amazing. Um, it's about preserving our uh, community's history, as we just talked about. It's about creating the first um, conservation effort for a naturally seeded uh, meadows and forests within our urban community. And it's about providing a community connector like no other community connector Jersey City has had to this date. So we wanted to start off with a video showing how this redevelopment plan is the catalyst for Jersey City connecting to um, the greater East Coast Greenway, um, even beyond um, our city neighborhoods here. So Mallory, could you play the video? Sure. All right, bear with me one second here. All right, we're gonna have to view this out of um, presentation mode just to make sure it's streamlined. So sorry, this is a little less graceful, but we wanna make sure you all can um, hear and see the video accordingly. The embankment is envisioned as part of the East Coast Greenway that connects Florida to Maine, much like the Appalachian Trail. And right now, this coastal trail, it has no path through Jersey City, and the embankment hopes to be the catalyst to make that happen. By assembling three separate greenways through Jersey City, the Essex Hudson Greenway, Bergen Arches, and the embankment. Starting with the Essex Hudson Greenway and headed towards New York City, which you see here in the background, this off-roads, rails to trails experience brings you through native salt marshes and forests from the Meadowlands. Then you ascend into the Bergen Arches where the tra trains cut through the Palisades. It's as if you've entered a time warp into a forgotten canyon, a true wilderness where the city floats above you. And it's here that this off-roads path starts cutting through the densest part of Jersey City, offering green space that is so scarce in the urban context. And it's not a park space, no, it's naturally grown, naturally seeded, not planted at all, a true Palisades experience. Then you pop out of the Bergen Arches with New York City in front of you, and you are hovering over downtown Jersey City, where you can see the historic roots of the infrastructure of the railroad. You enter back into the forest of the Palisades, where you really can start to see nature take back over, that infrastructure of our forgotten past, where you can actually learn about nature with our community. Then, there's the embankment, cutting right through the historic neighborhoods of downtown Jersey City, bringing you to the riverfront of New York City. It's built of stone and earth, 30 feet above the city, where natural meadows and forests have reclaimed the ground. It's amazing up there. <laughs> it really transports you right outside the city, only then to be confronted with the largest, most dense city in the United States, New York City. And we all hope to make our cities more sustainable. Our mission? Well, it's to preserve these meadows and forests and show that out of our industrial past, a new type of ecology can thrive and make our cities healthier places for people to live, while at the same time, 
connecting us with our greater regional environment and living with this natural habitat as actually part of our community. So we produced this video um, and I think it was it was choppy on my end, so I'd imagine it'd be choppy on everyone else's end going through Zoom. So we'll put um, the link to it in um, in a chat or um, we'll also put it on our website so everyone can take a look at it. Um, but this redevelopment plan really kind of sets the foundation for our community to connect to the greater outdoors. We're talking about 15 different states, 450 different cities, a 3,000 mile long corridor um, that's open space and natural. Um, it's an amazing opportunity for Jersey City to be part of. Uh, the next slide, Marilyn. And so the embankment is really the first segment um, that will be able to be developed um, to be part of this corridor and really become the um, catalyst to this green um, infrastructure. And the hope is that the Greenway will continue this vision west through the Bergen Arches and the Assis Hudson Greenway. Next slide, Marilyn. But today, what's really, really special about it, what you heard in the video, is that the landscape, um, that it's been untouched by humans for about 30 years. Um, in that time, a completely natural landscape has grown um, right in the center of our city. Um, I don't know any other city in the world that has um, a naturally seeded forest eight blocks from its city hall, and we can be the first. Next slide. And its current ecosystem, Mally, if you can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, it's currently I think it's lagging. Hold on one second. Its current ecosystem, as you can see, and if you walk by it um, during the summer, it's thriving, it's growing, and it's completely novel, completely unique to our own um, climate here in Jersey City. It's like no other ecosystem in the world. It's place specific and it's homegrown um, and, um, and doesn't need our help. Uh, go to the next slide, please. So the vision for the embankment, it's an, it's an ecological vision, one where we work with nature rather against it, shepherding a self-sustaining environment, not one that's relying on us, like gardens or parks or, or plazas, in order to make you know, Jersey City even more sustainable. Next slide. And if you go up there today, and this was in the video, if it wasn't chopping out, it's, it really is amazing. This is a picture from up there. You feel as if you've been transported right outside of the city. Um, I don't know any other place that you can kind of get this type of feeling, um, this kind of Palisades wilderness right in our backyard. If you go to the next slide. And the idea would be that we would create a continuous rails to trail corridor from Manila Ave to the Bergen Arches, staying above the city. Um, and the trail would mostly be towards 6th Street side of the embankment, keeping people away from the private backyards of residents on the 5th Street. Um, if you can go to the next slide. And along this path, uh, we plan on conserving the densest part of the uh, forest in blocks three through five for passive experiences where the city kind of fades away and you're kind of immersed in the outdoors. And then creating a, you know, the, an area that you come out into, um, into sunny meadows where you can see, as you see in the picture here, where you can see the city again, the historic neighborhoods and even New York City. Next slide. And we imagine that there'll be three types of natural environments along this continuous path. There'll be land bridges that continue the separate embankment blocks and stitch them together above the streets. There'll be meadows where we have playful landscapes where you can freely explore and roam. And there'll be forests where the spirit of the rails to rails pathway um, can bring you right through um, this new type of park experience. Next slide. So starting with the forest, this kind of more passive landscape, um, if you go to the next slide, it really kind of begins, as we said, with the conservation of the existing ecosystem with a really light touch. Um, you know, we don't you know, need to put a lot up there, light as possible, adding just enough for the space to become safe for us to explore uh, with a more natural permeable surface akin to the things that you see really in kind of our greater national parks. Um, with a focus on the beauty of the landscape around you rather than the actual park infrastructure that's moving through it. Um, and it's a quiet place, a place to explore, a place to kind of escape the city, as I said. Um, next slide. And then moving to block two and six, this is more of the active landscape, more of the meadow landscape. If you go to the next slide. And really here, it's about focusing on gathering and interacting with the meadows, offering outdoor classroom spaces that are so needed in today's environment. Places where we can have environmental art, wildlife observation platforms, or simply a place just to socialize with your friends and family. You can go to the next slide. And then lastly, what pulls us all together would be the land bridges. Next slide. 
And these bridges, they want to extend the notion of the forest and the meadows across the street, being light as possible still, but adding some habitat um, area to what already exists, ensuring that it's a continuous corridor for war, for everybody, for even plants, insects, animals, for, for all of our community. Next slide. And the vision of the embankment is for it to really be accessible to everybody, you know, providing ADA accessible ramps and elevators to get the path um, onto the embankment, connecting streets, you know, every three or four blocks um, from the waterfront to the Bergen Arches so that it actually touches every neighborhood. Next slide. And what's really important about the vision as well is that these walkways, these structures, these bridges, they really embrace the ecological vision. They tackle the climate change issues of today's constructed environment. They want to increase biodiversity. They want to clean the air. They want to manage water. They want to really embody carbon um, in all the new ways possible. Next slide. Because an ecological vision, it's a sustainable one. Um, it will make us much more resilient here in Jersey City. Um, and it's really a big part of the city if you take a look at it, if you go to the next slide. Because the redevelopment plan, it's, it's about six acres of public open space. Six acres is a lot for any city. Um, it's really important to us. Next. And those six, those six acres, they're already doing a ton of work for the city. They're sequestering about 120 tons of carbon dioxide per year. Next slide. And the mature forests, they actually clean the air too. Surprisingly, how much they clean the air. They absorb noxic oxide from the air and they replace it. That's responsible for, by the way, most of the asthma that we have in our city and replace it with over 88 tons of oxygen each year. Next slide. And then we're, <laughs> and forests, they're thirsty. They're really thirsty. Um, so they really help with managing our stormwater and flooded issues here in Jersey City. They soak up about 8.6 million gallons of stormwater each year. And that's not all. Uh, if you go to the next slide, the embankment itself really helps as the earth warms. The embankment is responsible for reducing our city heat island effect by about five degrees, cooling the surrounding neighborhoods that uh, are adjacent to it. Next slide. And while we're one of the most diverse cities in the nation, the embankment greatly increases our biodiversity. And I believe that with the embankment, we might be able to become even more um, diverse within the city. Next slide. And the embankment will also be a place for making connections with our culture, making connections with our art. In, in a city with, that has many artists, the ecological vision offers a place for environmental and ephemeral art, like Andy Goldsworthy, or like local artists in the center here, uh, Lena Farah, she, she, you know, she's working with us and, and, and doing this amazing art. And then we're also actually having a show this fall that's called Bank Me On My Mind, and the botanical art that you see on the right will be part of the show with many other artists that talk about how we actually are redefining our relationships with the environment. Next slide. But the best thing about the ecological vision is that it's economically sustainable. The meadows and forests, they already exist. No need to design them to have, you know, buy more trees, all that stuff. It's an evolved, naturally thriving landscape without us doing anything to it, without us watering it or tendering to it. And it's little maintenance. It's a new type of urban park. It's an urban park that Jersey City can inspire people all from around the world to take a look at what we're doing here. Next slide. And even though we don't have access to the embankment yet, while we wait for the settlement to be resolved and the redevelopment plan to be built, we are also actually began researching and partnering with Rutgers University and partnering with the Meadowlands Environmental Research Institute to document the entire Harsmith branch and the embankment using drone technology to get every square inch of this continuous corridor documented. Next, next slide. So we're using both video and photography to capture the walls, to capture the landscape from multiple angles, even including the Bergen Arches and the Exus Hudson Greenway in order to have a full understanding of the potential of the Greenway as it moves through Jersey City. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, you know, this is much, much more intense than Google Maps. We can zoom into every square foot of the landscape and pull out individual tree species, their size, their health, how they're expanding. Um, and we're starting that research now um, after capturing the entire uh, path. Next slide. And we're currently in the process of actually identifying, cataloging all the different ecological assemblages that exist within the Greenway, because this is the only way that we'll be able to have uh, informed decisions about how to move through the forest, capture the best experiences, and actually evolve over the next hundred years um, to make sure that it's healthy like our community. Next slide. 
And so Stephen uh, Gutierrez, the president of the Bankman Coalition, is going to talk a little bit about um, the support and, and how we're and how we're moving forward. Stephen, you're on mute, remember. Thank you, Sean. Um, thank you for uh, doing such a great job presenting our vision. And thank you, Mallory, for all the hard work in pulling tonight's meeting together and all the work you've done on these plans. Um, we'd also like to thank all the individuals, citywide neighborhood associations and groups, regional and national organizations that have supported our goals. We have kept your interests in mind over the years and your thoughts and concerns about the environment, historic preservation, land conservation, and other civic issues have influenced our thoughts. We believe this vision is a product of all of our combined efforts. Uh, just briefly, uh, securing the embankment parcels has been a very complicated and difficult process involving many parties that has challenged us for almost 25 years and continues to challenge us daily. Um, we will continue to do our best to ensure that the great opportunity is realized. Um, the redevelopment plans presented tonight are only a part of what needs to get done. These plans are subject to a settlement agreement that will, that will encompass additional important details not covered here, such as how the land is transferred to the city, the obligations of each of the parties involved and litigation resolution. The settlement agreement is still in process of being negotiated. We are working to have it closely reflect where possible the term sheet signed by all parties before Conrail walked away from the table. And we hope to update you on the progress that we're making in the coming weeks. Right now, here's what you can do to participate in the process. I believe you have this on the next screen. Uh, so here are some of the uh, allied organizations that I thanked at the beginning of my short speech. Uh, next slide. And you can continue. So uh, please let planning know you support the plan's emphasis on a light touch treatment for the embankment with a focus on preservation, conservation, and with minimal infrastructure that we've presented and that the plan uh, uh, is embodying. Uh, so you can uh, participate in the question and answer period tonight. We hope you do so. We hope you give your comments and follow up with uh, Mallory, she invites your emails and her email address is on the screen. Uh, stay involved. This plan is a draft and it will go through further iterations. Uh, keep informed by subscribing to embankment emails. Request uh, the, the, the address is on the screen and ensure you are on the planning division's email, email for this plan. Um, there's also a comment portion tonight and we hope you participate in that. And, and express your support for the vision. And lastly, attend land use board and council meetings when this redevelopment plan and the proposed settlement are up for approval. Thanks for your time. I'll turn it back over to Mallory. Great, thanks, Stephen. Okay, so now that I think we framed the historic uh, preservation component of this plan. And then now that we have a better understanding of what the EPC's vision for the open space is, we're gonna um, circle back with what this means in terms of the zoning for the open space network within this redevelopment plan. Um, so I just wanna clarify and iterate that the purpose of the redevelopment plan is not to design the open space. Um, the purpose is to put certain land uses on the land that will be used for open space, to put certain high level requirements from a design standpoint, and um, to encourage design guidelines for how the open space could be approached in the future. But this is not an exercise um, to basically charrette out exactly what this park is going to be. That is a much longer process that will involve many rounds of community engagement and um, a much more detailed in-depth opportunity for you all to voice your opinions, to have a, a more clear visual of what um, alternatives the city is exploring moving forward. 
and to um, work with the EPC in implementing and integrating their vision into the open space design in the future. So again, the purpose of the redevelopment plan is just really to allow this land use to occur. Um, so currently the, the land that exists here today is zoned primarily R1, which is a residential zone within the city that allows for one and two family homes. Um, and so we will be changing that zoning to really transform these parcels to be used as open space. Um, so zone one, we're gonna just go over some of the standards here um, to give you all some more clarity of what is in the plan. And then we will move on to some discussion. So general purpose of this zone is to, uh, similar with the general purpose of the plan, right? Because this is the largest zone in the plan and this is really the basis of the plan being created is to preserve and adaptively reuse the existing historic Harzmus branch rail line and embankment structures within the plan area to create a continuous elevated open space and trail system. Um, so the permitted principal uses of the plan, as I just said, are open space trail and parks, light rail and or trolley rights of way and light rail and or trolley stations and platforms. So we're really um, transferring the land from being permitted for residential development to being permitted solely for use as open space and trail network. Now remember the, the one um, development part of this plan boundary is in a different zone. So um, that's not covered, that's covered in zone two, not zone one of the plan. And that's just that one parcel for the one six story project. Zone one is the remaining uh, land within the plan. So it's you know basically eight blocks and, and one of which is just a portion of the block on block seven. And, um, and that will be used for open space under what the plan will now permit. Permitted accessory uses. So these are kind of sub uses that are associated with the principal uses of open space. Are facilities commonly associated with open space to serve the general public, the display of public art and informational structure limited to at grade street level of block seven. Now, what does that mean? So if you recall, when we went over the boundaries of the plan, block seven is that portion where the there's one remaining stanchion and then the portion of the block will be subdivided out for the one development project. And because um, this is the transition of the park from the, at late, uh, the elevated embankment structures to just the existing grade, which is most, mostly surface parking today on that block, and the remaining stanchions that exist on block seven and eight. So today, block seven and eight exist at grade, whereas blocks two through six are elevated. The hope in the future is that we will also build um, an elevated structure on these blocks that will allow that elevated network to continue, but that doesn't mean that we don't wanna contemplate the uses of this space at grade, right? At, when I say at grade, I'm, saying, I'm meaning at street level. Um, and so, you know, we worked with the embankment Preservation Coalition and really tried to prioritize their vision of, of light touch. And so we felt that there would be more opportunities for more um, traditional park programming in the at grade portion because we wouldn't be disturbing the natural forest that way. So, and, and we would be limiting, um, you know, impact to any kind of natural forest by allowing those more traditional programs to occur in um, what is mostly today surface level parking. So, we also thought it would be a great idea to allow for um, a single structure that could be used for um, some mode of an information center regarding the embankment. So we'll have some questions on that for feedback in a little bit, but the way it's um, envisioned in the plan right now is really just to allow for a single structure with a maximum height of 15 feet. Um, that would be limited to about 450 square feet. For reference, this is about the size of a shipping container. Um, so when you see kind of some projects of like uh, tiny houses or pop-up kiosks or things like that, that reuse um, shipping containers, it's about that size. Um, and that the programming of the structure shall be limited to informational and educational purposes. So this could be something that speaks to the history of the branch, the Harzmus Branch Railway Corridor and the history of the rail use on the land. Um, this could be something that speaks to other relevant ecological or sustain sustainable characteristics of the trail system and the general region. So that doesn't have to be fully fleshed out yet, but we're just allowing for that structure with some kind of information community center to occur. 
And then um, we have several elements of the plan that really call for, again, future design and programming um, shall be developed through larger community-driven engagement and visioning process, which should include general uh, consultation with the general public, relevant stakeholders, both local and regional, and the Embankment Preservation Coalition. Okay, getting into some of the requirements more specifically um, for this zone. So block all of blocks in zone one, so all of the blocks in the plan, because it does span the entire plan, um, shall provide for a continuous ADA compliant public walkway and bikeway. So the trail network will be ex fully accessible for the full run of the, the redevelopment area. Um, just a quick reminder to my other panelists, if you could all put yourself on mute, I think I'm getting a little bit of background noise from someone. So um, moving on, all blocks within zone one shall provide for pedestrian scaled lighting. So we do want um, you know, the park to be operable year round, particularly like in winter um, when we have shorter days that the path will still be navigable. Um, we also want to ensure that the bridges are ADA accessible. So that's a, a little bit more challenging from a logistic standpoint because the bridges will have to have a certain level of clearance underneath them for trucks and such to operate on the, the street grid below. Um, so there's some more details to be worked out in the design phases of park implementation as to how high those bridges have to be, how do they come back down and meet these, the embankment level and the park level. Um, but they will ensure ADA accessibility across the run. Um, and then another requirement that the open space improvement shall, to the extent practicable, limit the removal of mature tree canopy. So um, as Sean covered, there, there is really substantial mature tree canopy and uh, you know our priority is to disturb that as little as humanly possible. Of course, some disturbance will have to occur for things like the bridge landings and the integration of the trail system, um, but we really want the priority to be on, you know, minimizing the impact of, of public use on the, the site. Uh, open space planning design shall consider appropriateness of species. So this is similar to, um, similar notion to the above. Not only do we want to limit disturbance to what is there, but we also want to ensure that anything we add is the right plant for the right place, meaning that um, the utmost priority is really the preservation of the existing structure, right? The preservation of the historic asset. So we don't wanna be putting trees, new trees very close to the, the wall that in 30, 40 years could structurally compromise the wall, right? Because they might have really invasive, strong, quick growing root systems. Um, so it's more just that the planting design needs to consider the, the preservation of the historic structure as a, as a priority and that um, it needs to be very thoughtful in planting design whenever we are adding new plant material. Um, moving forward, we also understand that it, in that this will be a public open space, there will be some level of mechanical and utility equipment that is required to operate this as a park. So, some, you know, as I said before, we're talking about things like lighting or um, things like water that might have to be brought up to the elevated park level. Um, and, and we wanna ensure that as these things are integrated that their footprint is as minimal as possible and that they're screened from public view and access. So you shouldn't notice these things in the experience of the park. You know, we wanna preserve that, that natural experience and that kind of like forest in the city vibe. Um, and so part of that is ensuring that the equipment that's necessary to, to open this to the public doesn't, you know, completely uh, control or deter that experience. And uh, lastly, all streetscapes shall be um, lit and designed in accordance with Jersey City forestry standards. So this will actually be a, a great, I think, improvement um, from the existing condition where there actually is no sidewalk even, no formal sidewalk on a lot of the um, northern side of Sixth Street or the northern side, sorry, southern side of Sixth Street, northern side of the embankment redevelopment area. So you, you see the two pictures at the bottom. These are uh, some photos from block four. So this is the, the sidewalk against the embankment wall on block four. And you can see there's almost no tree canopy. So it's, there's just this one tree, which is quite a large, impressive tree. Um, but, you know, 
he's the only the only lone tree on the street level. So the great thing about part of redeveloping this is that the streetscape will also get um, improved as the park gets developed. And so just like a quick analysis across the run of the entire redevelopment area, there's a potential for over 60 new street trees to be planted along this corridor. So that, that's a great improvement to the streetscape. It reinforces that natural environment and natural feel of the embankment and just helps to boost a lot of the sustainable performative landscape measures that Sean had discussed. Um, and then we're getting into design guidelines. So again, I, you know, like I said, the to specifically and detailed design the park and open space is not the purpose or objective of a redevelopment plan, but we did want to reinforce the vision that the EPC has built um, through years of engagement and years of advocacy um, in the plan. So we, we set this up through a series of design guidelines. One second here, I'm gonna take a sip of water. And so um, what do some of these guidelines look like that that planting design should reference um, the Jersey City Ecological Corridor Report, which is a report that the EPC composed and that will be attached to the redevelopment plan as an appendix. So there will be kind of an, a preliminary inventory of plant species and plant material to build future designs off of. Um, the vision open space and trail system should acknowledge the naturally seeded forest. So again, we're just reinforcing that notion of um, understanding that this, this, what was a rail corridor has really transformed as an environment over the past decades and that that should be acknowledged and preserved. And then emphasizing sustainable low impact programming. So, you know, we're not looking to put ball fields and other uh, kind of what we would call quote traditional park or traditional active recreation programming. That's not the purpose of this open space. This open space is serving a, a different purpose within the city. And again, um, reinforcing that the future design and programming should concentrate any of that traditional open space programming, such as playgrounds, outdoor classrooms, seating nodes, et cetera, to blocks two and six, as was discussed uh, by Sean in the vision. And then the at grade portions of seven and eight um, would also be an appropriate place for some of that more traditional open space programming. Whereas um, blocks three through five are really about prioritizing the preservation of the corridor, the ecological corridor. Um, we also have a guideline in here for using uh, natural and sustainable materials to the maximum, maximum extent practicable. So we want um, the materiality of, of the trail of any elements like seating or outdoor classrooms to respond to the existing environment. Um, so we don't want a strong contradiction between something that's highly manufactured or overly designed. Um, but that's, that everything that's put on the site for public use and enjoyment of the site integrates into the site. And similarly, that um, in that same vein, that lighting design takes the same approach where this is not about a decorative fixture. This is not about um, anything ornamental. This is just about utility of, of lighting things as needed. And um, also that any fencing should be as minimal as possible. We do understand that fencing will be a reality. We are on an elevated park. There are safety standards that need to be met to keep the public safe when you're enjoying a space like this. Um, so that will be kind of a new element introduced into the open space, but um, we want it to be designed thoughtfully. And then um, lastly, just making sure that the streetscape also considers the really the spirit of the elevated park in trying to look at alternative materials for sidewalks, um, things that are more porous and more permeable that really speak to the overall vision and making sure that the street level and the at grade level um, is just as integrated with the elevated environment. Okay, so I think that kind of gives you a good understanding of what's in the plan. Um, I'm gonna go through just a couple of next steps and then we'll open up um, some polling, we got a couple questions to ask you guys, get some high level feedback, and then um, we'll have a general Q&A. So thank you all for joining tonight. We really appreciate you dedicating your time. Um, and here's a couple ways to stay involved and what you can expect to be coming online soon moving forward. Um, so we will have similar to how we did things last time, we will have a full draft 
of the redevelopment plan posted to the city's data portal. Um, the target right now is September 12th, so that's next Monday. So you will be able to view the full draft. So I covered a lot of like the high level things, but you'll be able to kind of dig in as, as much as you'd like to the language specifically and review things more in depth and on your own time. Um, we will have also the recording of this meeting and a copy of this slide deck posted on the data portal for your viewing. So if you wanna share with your neighbors or family who didn't get to attend tonight, they can still uh, keep up to speed and they, they won't miss out. Um, and then we'll, we'll also keep updates on the planning board schedule and links to the final plan on that page as well. So following the meeting, like I said, um, once we have everything up on the data portal next Monday, uh, we will send out an email blast to anyone who registered for the meeting. So even if you know someone who registered but ended up not able to make it at the last minute, they'll get all these updates and they'll get access to everything. We will have another running public comment period open until Friday, 923. So it's about uh, 10 days from now, a little more than 10 days. A little more than 10 days, I think. I can't remember what day it is anymore. <laughs> but um, so you can email me your questions, your comments. If you have some kind of more in-depth comments or questions, I'm happy to schedule a call. Um, a lot of you did email me after the last meeting, which was great. And I think I had a couple kind of back and forth conversations with some of you. So you're welcome to do so again. And we encourage you to review the plan more in depth and give us some feedback. Um, and then kind of the more like nitty gritty timeline moving forward. So the Lewis Marin redevelopment plan, which is that redevelopment plan that's specific to block one is slated to go to HPC next Monday. So that will be presented to the HPC. Uh, that is a big step, especially as the block one of the plan is uh, landmarked as Maggie had expressed. And then the target um, moving that forward is that we will bring that to planning board, those amendments to that plan to planning board on September 22nd. So uh, that's the goal right now, but again, we will keep you updated should that date change um, through, the, through the email blast and through the link to the data portal. So that will be updated uh, should that shift at all. But right now we, we should be good to be on track for that timeline. And again, that's just specifically for the language related to block one in the existing redevelopment plan. So what does it mean for the new plan, the Sixth Street Embankment Redevelopment Plan? Um, we will be appearing at the next HPC meeting, which is October 3rd. And then um, we have a target planning board of October 11th. So again, keep up with that link once I send it out to you. Um, we also will, we can do a second email blast before we go to planning board with that new plan so that everyone kind of gets an updated calendar reminder. And uh, we encourage you to, to come and, and kind of hear, we'll go over the final plan at that board meeting and then the uh, commissioners will vote on whether or not they recommend the plan to be adopted by city council. So the way this would work is first step is HPC to get the re recommendation from HPC. The next step would be planning board for, to get the recommendation from planning board to go to city council. And then it would have to go through two readings at city council be voted to pass. So it's still a substantial timeline. In an ideal world, we're looking at uh, November for a full adoption of the plan by city council. And just keep in mind that this is a working document. So the version that I post online next week, there will be changes. Um, at this point, nothing is going to drastically change or the trajectory is not gonna take a 180, uh, but there, there will be some different language or massage language based on the draft that's posted and what goes to planning board. Okay, so to kick off some of our engagement, Liz, I'm gonna ask you to uh, start the poll. But we just had a couple questions that all, they're not even uh, necessarily directly related to language in this plan, but they're more just to help us as the city kind of take a preliminary uh, temperature on, on where the community is at with the open space. So you should have a poll popping up. You can select an answer. I'm just gonna give it a couple seconds, but the question is what embankment quality excites you most? So we're gonna let this run. Looks like we're at about half of you have responded. I'm gonna give it a couple more seconds. I'd like to get to about at least 70% of participation in these polls. 
<clears throat> All right, so it looks like no, oh, we'll give it people are still answering, so we'll give it a couple more seconds. Okay, it looks like we're at about 85% participation and we've slowed down. So um, right now, Liz, I don't know, can you share results for the question? All right, hopefully you can all see this. Right now, it looks like the thing that excites you all most is the natural landscape. So that, that's great for us to know moving forward to make sure that that's embedded as a priority in, in design as uh, other divisions take on the, the design of the open space. So again, what we're here really presenting to you is under the purview of city planning, which is the writing and the adoption of the, the redevelopment plan. And then other divisions within the city will take on the actual design, the community engagement for that. And then the, um, the funding, the financing for the park and the implementation of the park. Okay, great. Next question. Okay, I'm opening that up now. Okay, so next question is, what nature-based programs would you like to see here in this park? So as these aren't gonna be the only options that are discussed down the road, but these are just a few initial options. You can answer, I think we are allowing you to answer up to two. Um, oh, sorry. So select two that excite you most. Again, this is not a comprehensive list. Um, and if you answer other here, please keep your suggestions in mind when we open up for general question in a minute, I would love to hear more ideas from people. So this is your chance. If you have a big idea and you wanna see it in the park, uh, keep it in the top of your head for the next few minutes. All right, we'll give us a couple more seconds. Okay, Liz, it looks like it's kind of stalled if we want to share results. Yep. So it looks like the top two answers were smaller seating nodes for reading, introspection, and conversation, and followed by very close a tie really between the guided arboretum experiences to learn about flora and fauna and the wildlife observation platform. So I think those two um, work very well together and, and can really be accomplished in uh, you know one approach. So that's great to know. And a couple others. So I hope people give some suggestions, like I said, in the conversation portion. All right, two more questions for you all. Thanks for playing along. Like I said, this is helpful for us to just kind of take this information and it's a great starting point for us to frame uh, public engagement in the future as a city, as we move into design. Okay, so next question, what would you like to see in the block seven structure? So if you remember, I talked about that small structure um, at, at grade at block seven, we had some size limitations on it, but what kind of programming would you like to see inside of that structure? Again, very interested to hear some others for this. Can give a couple more seconds. Okay, Liz, looks like we can close out. All right, so it looks like, again, pretty close in responses, but um, 
the majority would like to see a community greenhouse garden. That's very cool. I don't think we have a substantial one of those that's open to the wider public. I know we have some community gardens throughout the city. They're more localized and more neighborhood based. So that would be a great program to bring followed closely by community center meeting and gallery space. So again, a really cool opportunity for meetings in a unique environment here. It's good for us to know. Okay, and last question. When the embankment is built, how will you use this open space? Now, I promise I won't hold you to this. You can use it in as many ways as you would like, but we're just trying to get an understanding of what you think your primary use and your primary interaction of the park would be. We hope you use it in many ways. But. Okay, give it a couple more seconds here. All right, Liz, I think we can close that out. So it looks like the majority of people, almost a dead tie between recreational walking, hiking and bicycling and quiet enjoyment. So I think that aligns very well with the way the plan is written in terms of the intent of the open space and the general guidelines. Um, I'm actually surprised the, that only 8% said for getting from one place to another in a safe off-road route. Um, so we'll have, to, we'll have to work with transportation engineering and the uh, you know, bike JC and all that to really promote uh, this as a, as a great alternative path as well for just your daily, daily trips. Um, and again, anyone who said other, please hold on to that and, and raise your hand in the conversation to come. Okay, so that's it for the polling. Thanks all for participating. And now we're going to open this up for general conversation. Um, so Liz, if you want to end the polling, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen for now. If you do have questions about a specific slide, I can always pull it back up. Um, but again, if you have like a very specific question about just like text somewhere, all that, that might be better served to just shoot me an email and I can clarify it for you. Um, but don't hesitate to raise your hand and join in here. Um, so in order to uh, do this, for those of you who are not as familiar with Zoom, uh, you can raise your hand to speak. And, and what I mean by that is quite literally use the raise your hand button in Zoom. If you hover over usually the bottom of your screen, a little toolbar will pop up where you can, um, there's a, a quite a hand icon and you can click that to raise your hand and that will put you in the queue for the comment portion. And then what will happen is we'll promote you one by one to speak and we'll allow you, um, when you speak, you'll be able to unmute yourself and uh, we'd love for you to put your video on. We know not everybody wants to, but we love to engage with an actual face and not a black screen. So please turn your video on. And um, just a time check, I know we were running until eight o'clock. Um, it's 7.55 right now. I think we can go to about 8.15. I wanna be respectful of everyone's time, but I do wanna give us uh, you know, at least 20 minutes to really have a good conversation here. So starting with that, um, those of you who drop off between now and the end of the meeting, thanks again for joining. As I said, you can shoot me an email, mclark, M as in Mary, Clark with no E at jcnj.org with any comments or questions. The comment period is running through September 23rd. And Liz, if we can start with Danny. Yep. And also just for people calling in on a phone, you can uh, hit star nine if you would like to talk. So I just promoted Danny to panelist. Okay, hi Danny, you should be able to unmute yourself and turn on your video if you can. Okay, happy uh, Wednesday everyone. Hello, thank you. I just want to say thank you for all your efforts. This is a 
uh, especially uh, Steve. I know you've been doing this forever. And uh, just want to say we appreciate it. So uh, my name is Danny Victor once again, and my wife and I own our home on Fifth Street, and we fully support the embankment vision that, you know, as we all know, has been a community effort for probably way over 20 years. I think it's a great opportunity to have something unique for Jersey City residents, and we want to make sure we keep that forest up there. We look at it from, you know, our backyard and our deck, and we love it. It's one of the reasons why we moved over here, and uh, yeah, we're, we're all for it. Great. So that's really all I have to say. Great. Thanks, Danny. All right. Thank have you. Have a good night. All right. Okay. Liz, I think we can promote Sam. Okay, Sam, I think you are promoted. You can um, unmute yourself and turn your camera on if you can. Well, the camera is not working. So uh, thank you for letting me um, speak as president of the Friends of Liberty State Park, an open space advocacy organization. We thank you planners for working on this a uh, special opportunity for our city. Uh, we urge you to implement the two decades vision of a forest and meadows. The broad public consensus has always been for priceless, scarce urban open space and urban nature. I live three blocks from the embankment and I'm excited about having this natural treasure park of forests and meadows in the neighborhood and in our city. So we have this chance to save nature which has made such a dramatic recovery. Uh, so thank you for working on this rare mission, this groundbreaking uh, vision of green open space on this elevated structure. And urban nature, as you all know, is essential for our quality of life and our mental and emotional health. So I urge you what you haven't tonight deviated from the inspiring and wise ecological corridor vision of the Embankment Preservation Coalition. So this administration will become known for saving a forest, uh, which is uh, amazing that uh, this will be such a legacy for future generations. It's a golden opportunity to provide access to a, a nature wonderland. Uh, so the, the treasure shouldn't be commercialized in any way. And I didn't hear any hints of that tonight, uh, this trans formative nature oasis vision will be a beacon of peacefulness and beauty. And it will support local businesses on street level and I'm sure some new businesses will emerge. So thank you for honoring and respecting the 20 years of community support for creating this, this treasure. Uh, now I, I do have a question about what you meant by, you used the term early on about active recreation programming but then later I heard you talk about some active recreation programming on the street uh, surface level. So I just see clarity on that uh, term of, of where and what the active recreation programming uh, would be uh, for this uh, extraordinary uh, passive recreation plan uh, for the elevated block. So if you could just address that, I'd appreciate it. And thank you so much, Mallory and everyone. No problem, Sam. And just for some clarity, um, when we say active recreation in the context of this plan, you know, things like walking and biking are active recreation. Um, trail uses inherently are active recreation. Um, we, we're not speaking to active recreation in terms of, again, like more traditional, like a soccer field or uh, you know, a basketball court or things we might program in more traditional urban parks. Um, but, but we would still allow for active recreation, but it would be active, active recreation that's aligned with the, um, the vision of the overall trail network. So when I say active, I mean, I mean more in terms of being related to a trail use as opposed to um, more traditional programming that we would see again for like when we think of kind of like 
youth recreation, I think is how we would typically envision that in other parks in the city. Thank you. No problem. Thanks, Sam. Have a good night. Okay, Liz, I think next up is Chris. Okay, should be a panelist now. Okay, Chris, I see you promoted. You can unmute yourself and turn your camera on if you can. Hi, I can't turn my camera on, but can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I just, I wanna keep my question quick. Um, thank you guys so much for everything that you're showing. I think it sounds really cool, especially the light touch aspect. I think it's really important. Um, I'm just thinking about this project in comparison to like the High Line in New York City, where you saw, you know, that neighborhood really transformed after the High Line was done. So like rents went up, you see a reduction in small business. Um, I saw that you guys are including 15% affordable housing, which is really cool. But is there any other aspect of the plan that seeks to kind of like combat that like High Line effect thing? Um, so right now, because the scope of the plan is really only to permit one development, that's the, that's really what we're addressing. And so we do have that affordable housing um, clause. So anything that would happen like in other zones that are adjacent to this um, are subject to different zoning requirements. So they would be a, a separate exercise. Um, but just in general, for those of you who are less familiar, maybe with city planning or, or development and land use uh, specifically. So moving forward with the adoption of the city's um, inclusionary zoning ordinance, any major changes to zoning, so meaning any areas of the city that receive major zoning upgrades um, from what's permitted today would trigger the inclusionary zoning. So basically major up zoning that would happen move forward, there's predefined thresholds in the inclusionary zoning ordinance would be subject to affordability requirements in their development. So it is a, it's a standard that carries through all zoning of the city moving forward um, whenever those thresholds are triggered. Thank you so much. No problem, have a great night, Chris. Okay, next up is Donna. Okay, Don, I see you promoted. If you want to turn on your mic and camera, you can go ahead and start. Uh, Donna, if you're not sure, usually when you hover over the bottom of your screen, a little bar will pop up similar to where you said raise hand and there should be an unmute option. So there should be a microphone with a dash through it. There you go. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Yes. I remember when uh, Schindler took down the, the rail, the railway tracks between the uh, stanchions and threw the fences up. And you know what? It was a big improvement in a lot of ways, because what I envision here is a blossoming of the homeless community, especially with the sky high rents in Jersey City that their people are going to be drinking up there they're going to be vaping up there it's going to be loud noisy people are going to be committing a crime on e-bikes and go whiz through that thing that there's going to be lights noise the whole t the high it's going to be as bad as newark avenue it, it's just going to be noisy lots of homeless people especially where if you put water up there and a bathrooms forget it all these people who think they're going to enjoy that with their family and nice and quiet, I got news for you. There's going to be panhandlers there. It's it's going to be worse because right now all the homeless people are down by Marin Boulevard hanging out down in that last block of the embankment. It's going to become loaded. The other thing, so, so you need to have police in this plan. You're going to need to have cops on bikes to make sure that this embankment is safe. Otherwise, you know, people are going to get robbed up there because you can't have witnesses. Everybody's elevated. You know, I, I mean, it could be a real disaster. It might not turn out the way people are planning. The other thing is, as far as the natural environment goes, that, that embankment is loaded with poison ivy and ailanthus trees, which are an invasive species and the preferred host of uh, spotted lanternflies. So, you know, the natural environment is, uh, may not necessarily be the best thing. You're going to have to do a lot of weeding and pruning and yanking out trees up there. That's all I have. Thanks, Donna. 
All right. Okay, Liz, if you want to move on to Chena. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Please correct me. Hi, I'm Chana. Chana, okay, sorry. <laughs> oh, Chana, you just muted yourself. Hold on. Oh, sorry about there that. Yep. I mean, it's hard to follow Donna. That was, um, you know, something. But, uh, you know, I am a neighbor. I, I moved in about a year and a half ago. I'm right on the embankment. Um, my backyard, you know, um, has the overgrowth from the embankment. I, when I bought this place with my husband, you know, we were excited about the possibility our realtor told us about this. So um, had I known it was 20 years in the making, I would have been less optimistic. Um, <laughs> but you guys are inspiring me to remain optimistic. And I hope that in my tenure in this home that uh, we'll get to enjoy it. Uh, my main question, and I've talked to um, Solomon's office about this already and, and waiting for a response um, about the current owners and kind of the overgrowth that's coming into our yard, um, you know, kind of, lending itself to Donna's comments about the invasive species and, and the grooming. Um, and I know that Sean said something about, you know, minimal touch, but I'm wondering um, if there is, like when we say minimal touch, there, I feel like, like she said, there has to be some stuff done. You know, I feel like the, the neighbors have been disregarded for a while in this battle. Um, and I'm just hoping that we're considered in this, uh, both with our personal space being uh, glared into now and also, um, you know, the natural habitat that you guys are looking to keep up while um, it's coming over into our yard and into our space. I'm having severe stuff with the spotted lantern flies and I know that some of that comes from up there. And while I'm doing treatments, if nothing's being done up above, it's not mm -hmm. really gonna solve my problem. Um, and there's things I don't know, berries and whatnot that keep dropping into my yard and onto my furniture and staining um, my stuff and uh, causing severe weeds. So I just wanna make sure that when we say minimal that it'll be groomed enough to yeah. yes to yeah I mean, it's an important it's an important question um and one of the things that you know we need to look back to is going back to the teddy roosevelt era forest management is actually a, a thing uh, mm -hmm. and if we can actually manage our open spaces we can actually deal with these um these issues of things evolving and changing and also hurting it's ecosystem. And one of the things we want to do is make sure that the ecosystem stay healthy. So we will be managing those things. We also have to do an analysis of the rock walls to make sure that none of the, as you heard earlier, that we talked about that none of the rock walls are being displaced by the natural ecology. The truth is, you know, we could, we could remove the forest and we can spend millions and millions planting other trees up there. Um, and it will do about one third of the work that the forest is already doing. And so the idea with that, we'd be, be able to manage it really closely and actually be a lot more sustainable and a lot more economically um, uh, responsible by taking this approach. Um, so it's a great question and we can definitely talk about this a lot through the next processes. Yeah, and I just want to clarify that, you know, the goal, um, like I said, of the redevelopment plan is to really transfer ownership of this land to the city. So currently the city doesn't own that land, so the city can't maintain that land. Um, but inherently in any kind of city owned park space, there's some level of maintenance that will occur, right? Because now that we have public use occurring, we have to keep that site safe and maintenance is part of that. So the, the light touch isn't meant to say that it, it will be no maintenance. It's just that it will be low maintenance and that It'll be different from a traditional park where we're not out, you know, mowing lawns and fields and planting different annual flowers every year to, in planters and things like that. It'll be um, kind of the maintenance of the existing ecology, like Sean said, that is safe to continue to occur. But things like pruning trees um, that don't happen today, that will happen in the future um, as the city takes ownership and as the park is implemented. So. Do you guys know, I mean, I know it's not your responsibility, but I also know you're in constant communication with them and, or disagreement. Um, do you know if they're doing anything currently to treat the spotted lantern flies or anything else up there? I, I cannot speak to anything that's being done by current ownership. 
Okay. Well, thank you guys so much. I thanks. Like I said, I'm, I'm excited that hopefully it happens soon. Great. Have a great night. Okay. Liz, I think next up is Beatrice. Hi, Beatrice, you can unmute yourself. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Um, thanks so much for all the work you guys are doing. So excited to have this happen. Um, I just want to say I'm with Bike JC. And that right. last Yay. <laughs> was difficult because although, yes, oh my God, I'm so excited to have a safe path that would be like beautiful to go down and, and enjoyable. Um, picking it as like the top reason would be difficult because, you know, there's just, there's just so much to enjoy there. Um, mm -hmm. But, but definitely transportation, huge for people to safely get from Journal Square downtown. I live in the Heights. Um, so really excited about this project and hope to see it in my lifetime and my time in Jersey City. Um, and then Sean, you said you were gonna share that video. I think it's just a great thing to share with other people for them to get excited about stuff like visually. Um, so if you could, I don't know, pop it up somewhere so that we could find and share that, that'd be great as well. Yeah, there's no chat with this. Usually I'll pop it into the chat. So um, I don't know if there's, um, I think we were going to have all the, the lists of everybody here. But it's also if you just go to embankment.org. Okay. Um, it's um, also on our website and you can find all these things about the, envis uh, about the vision. Um, and it's pretty simple <laughs> because this has been over a 20 year effort. We actually have the rights to the word embankment on the internet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so yeah, and Sean, we can... We can yeah. include the link to the video, um, the page with the video in the email we send out to all the registrants perfect. so that people perfect. get access. Perfect, perfect. Thank, thank you as well for including like a ramp to get bicycles up. <laughs> and not, you know, that'll, I'm really excited. So thank you so much for the work you're all doing. Great, thanks Beatrice. All right, next up is Eric Hoffman. Hi, Eric. Hi, sorry. I uh, I missed the speaking portion of the last meeting by one person, you may recall. So I was in there prepping dinner. Excuse me while I just <laughs> re relocate into my backyard spot. Hi, everybody. Um, hi, Sean. Hi, Mally. It's nice to see everybody. Uh, Danny, Victor, I need to see you at the next v &A meeting. I miss seeing you. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm Eric Hoffman. I'm the president of the Village Neighborhood Association. I'm uh, actually just wanted to make you a few comments um, as an architect and and just as a as a Jersey City resident. For, first and foremost, you know, I, I'll, I have a few comments, kind of from the thirty thousand foot level down to call it you know minus a hundred feet. From the thirty thousand foot level, I hundred percent support this effort. I think the vision uh, is is a is a is a wonderful one. I I think that you know some of the concerns that you know, Donna and, and Shauna voiced are, are certainly valid. And, and in my mind, those are more, you know, operational concerns. I think the big hurdle is, you know, let's get the land, let's get, let's get, let's get moving, let's get it in the right hands. Um, and then, you know, most definitely there are some serious operational challenges, you know, to making sure that it's, that it's safe and that it's utilized in the way that, that, um, you know, you all are, are envisioning it to be, to be used. Um, coming down a little further, you know, I, I had some concerns that I wanted to speak to in the last meeting relative to the bulk zoning. Mm -hmm. um, and it was primarily on lot one. You'll recall there was that whole issue. And, and again, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm getting all this sort of third hand. I know you guys have been working for years on this, but there was that whole issue with the cantilever uh, on the north side of the right of way embankment in, in block one. And um, that, that gave me grave concerns. I, I see that is gone. Um, mm -hmm. I will just make a general comment just architecturally about, you know, the bulk zoning requirements. So, you know, it, it was a little alarming to me to, to see, you know, zoning envelopes that don't include uh, a sky exposure plane, uh, which, you know, for those that don't know, that's just the, you, you establish what the base of a building is, call it, you know, 50 to 70 feet. And then there is a virtual uh, plane. It's a, it's a diagonal or an angled plane 
that you are not allowed to cross over. And what that does is it starts to set buildings back more elegantly as they get to the top. So I think that ship may have sailed, but I did just want to make that comment um, just from an architectural standpoint. You know, those exposure planes are there to provide more light and air uh, on the street level. And given this is already starting at an elevated level, you know, I, I have concerns that, that a sheer volume, which as we know, developers will want to build to, and certainly admittedly as an architect, I would build to that as well, because that's what I would be instructed to do, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> fill out that, that zoning envelope. Um, and then, you know, sort of coming down a little further, again, I, I want to focus a little bit on uh, block seven, um, the, the, the village uh, blocks five through eight are, are in the village block seven and eight to me are a little anomalous at the moment because they're no longer part of the historic infrastructure, right? You go over there and there is, there's no longer the elevated embankment that, that, that you're seeing. You're seeing the stanchions and the, the remnants of, of uh, you know, history. Um, but I guess my biggest concern there is I, I would like to see community involvement. You know, I'd like uh, Mr. Gucciardo's <laughs> list of, you know, uh, alliance uh, uh, community, you know, uh, organizations to include the Village Neighborhood Association. I, I saw Enos Jones Park on there. I don't believe they have an association any longer. They are now part village, mostly Hamilton Park. Um, but that's that's neither here nor there. My, my point simply being that I think that the, you know we should be in, involved and the community should be involved in, in developments and not just from this, an aesthetic perspective, but from an access perspective. You know, I have questions about sort of when I'm on that block eight, how do I get back down to great from an ADA perspective? You know, that's a, that's a significant thing. And I know you all have been wrangling with this and, and talking about it. So um, that to me is, uh, it's not a concern. It's just something that I would like to, to see, you know, the community involved in. And again, I realize I'm getting into some minutia here from an architectural mm -hmm. standpoint, but um, in that same thread, I have to say my, my bigger concern here is, is at that minus hundred foot level where, you know, I, I want there to be some serious consideration about development. I know there was a little paragraph about means and methods, and it's something we've been fighting here in the village and, and throughout Jersey City, for that matter, which is the way foundations are, are being bored. Um, you know, it happened right here near PS5. It's happening all over where developers will come to us as a community association, and they'll sort of do the lip service and say, yes, you know, we will absolutely do auger piles or we'll do screw piles, things that are drilled into the ground and not hammered. And then there's a pile driver that's giving kids headaches during school hours. I think that's a real, real concern. And it and it it's it's a pro forma killer, right? I mean, developers have a pro forma, which is basically their numbers, their budget. And that's you know, it, it's super cheap to drive piles uh, when you have to get to 85 to 100 feet in depth to support a building of that of that height. Um, and it's, you know, it's a few million dollars more to go with something like a micro pile or something that's screwed in the ground. But I feel like we have sort of a unique opportunity here to say, hey, this is a sandbox unlike any other. You want to play in it, you're going to do it in this way. Um, I just wanted to throw that out there because I would hate to see when it finally gets to that moment and we're all excited, everyone knows the land is built and there's a developer starting to build a building there that, you know, it's months of, you know, pile driving and disturbing of neighbors. The, the, the last thing that I would, I would simply say on that is uh, relative to the height of the buildings, you know, I, 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 I do understand that there are logistical and, and design concerns that I am not privy to, which kept the right of way, the embankment right of way on block one on the north side. Um, I think it's, it's unfortunate from a, from a perspective of, of, you know, light and air, let's call it, you know, um, because I think that's going to, you know, cast a significant shadow on that embankment right of way being on the north side, you know, it's, it's rendered as a sort of stippled green, uh, which is lovely, but I, yeah, I don't know that you're going to get much green to stay there and to be maintained there. Um, again, I'm sure you've all been wrestling with this, but um, that, that to me is kind of like, you know, shadow studies and understanding the effect on the neighborhood goes back to my very first comment about sky exposure planes or something that when it gets to that level, I think we should consider. And like I said, I, I do understand some of that may have already been predetermined and maybe out of you know your our collective hands, but to the extent that we can affect uh, you know kind of a, a better look at the the volumetric assemblage of these buildings, um, I think we should try to do so. Thanks, everyone.
Great. Thanks, Eric. I think you made a lot of, of good points, and I think a lot of them become highly, highly relevant at site plan review. So, you know, I will be excited to see the VNA stay engaged with these developments. And, um, you know, that's where we trigger a lot of those kind of shadow study analyses and um, visual impact analyses and such. So it will be discussed further, definitely, as um, site plan applications come online down the road. Okay, so we're at 8.20. I'm going to um, go another 10 minutes, hard stop at 8.30. Um, if we don't get to you again, please send me emails with comments. If you want to schedule a call, I'm happy to schedule one. Just shoot me an email. It's mclark at jcnj.org. Uh, next up, we have Steve Cunningham. Hello, uh, I just wanna thank you guys for putting this on. Uh, like you said, I'm Steve Cunningham. I am a Jersey City resident. Uh, I am also a licensed and certified uh, hiking and camping guide with the American Hiking Guide Association and also with uh, the state of New York. Um, but really I am calling in to speak up for the youth as I'm also the founder and executive director of Team Wilderness, which uh, engages youth in Hudson County in outdoor activities. And um, part of the reason we do this, the main reason we do this, is because we understand that all the research shows that time in wild um, places, places that have a light touch like you're talking about, rather than saying a city park, which is very manicured and has a playground, a track and field, um, they have massive benefits to youth. Uh, the research shows that they can uh, decrease toxic stress, that they can increase self-confidence, that they can increase even academic performance. Um, unfortunately, the research also shows, research by the Youth Hispanic Access Foundation and the Center for American Progress, that 89% of youth of color and youth in low-income communities live in nature-deprived areas. So it is so vital that we do everything we can to preserve as much wild space in Jersey City because we're just allowing another thing to exist for our youth in the city to fall further behind on. And we can't allow that. That's the whole reason I started this organization. And that's the whole reason we support everything you guys spoke about. Everything that the Embankment Preservation Coalition stands for, the light touch is so important for the youth in this town. We take kids on trips up into the Catskills. We take them up to New York State and Pennsylvania and Delaware Water Gap. But sometimes when we're working with half days of schools, we're taking them out in town as well. And it is so important that we increase their opportunities for that. The Nature Preserve at Cave and Point's only open half the year and that half of the year does so much for them. That time in a wild untouched place, I cannot explain to you the looks on their face. You just have to come out there and see it yourself. It, they are moved by it. They don't realize they're still in town. They're in shock that they're so close to their home, that it existed, they didn't know about it. That's exactly what this place can be. And I am so excited by the work you guys are all doing so that we can expand the number of places um, that they can have, that they can do this in. And it is so important. So I just want to thank you all for what you're doing um, and know that we are behind you 100%. Great, Thank thanks, Steve. Steve. Really great comments. We appreciate it. Okay, next up we have Jean Daly. Hi, Jean. You should be able to unmute and turn your camera on if you can. Oh, I think I got it. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, fantastic. Um, no, I think some people had some marvelous things to say um, from the density as well as down to the invasive species because I am I hate our invasive species, um, which did bring me back to the area where the friends uh, or the embankment had mapped out areas in, I guess it was block eight, which is full of uh, Japanese knotweed. And I, I really have a strong feeling that as far as the environmental aspects go, we really need to get rid of the invasive species because they are taking away from our natural, um, say insects, the pollinators, um, it's the birds, 
they're they're reducing our amount of uh, natural native birds, et cetera, and they don't provide the seeds for them. But um, a couple things. One, because as you can see, I'm a nature person. Well, you don't know that, but I'm telling you now. Um, I'm concerned about all these high rises in Jersey City, including the one that's going to be put up on the embankment, about the bird crashes. It's we're in, starting the migration season again. And in New York, they have the Wild Bird Fund, which has, they rescue thousands of poor migrating birds that have smashed into the windows of these high rises and have died or have just been stunned and need to be re rehabilitated or the wings were broken or such like that. Is there anything we can do to make sure that this building on there will be bird proof? That to me is something extremely important. Um, we were also speaking about that block seven, two things that come to mind. One, it would be great to have that area, small area, if we could for a um, pollinator garden, Mm -hmm. uh, we are losing our monarchs. I mean, I'm doing some gorilla gardening. I'm raising monarchs and tagging them as well, not as we speak, but uh, it's very essential that we have our plantings be native to New Jersey and to this region. I find that to be very important. The um, two questions uh, I have is one, is there going to be any uh, demolition or um, eminent domain? in any of this plan. And the second one was Mike was concerned if there's an emergency that happens on the embankment, the ability for um, emergency vehicles to mm -hmm. get to the people up there. Um, so those are the, my two questions, but um, I'll, I would love to hear your answers. Thank you. You can turn me off. <laughs> okay. Um, so your first question was um, regarding like eminent domain. And so the way the plan is structured, um, eminent domain doesn't really need to be considered because in order to unlock the zoning within the development, the land is going to be transferred to the city. So that process is being is taking place and the city will become owners of the open space. And then the private land, the private development that's contemplated will remain in private ownership. Um, so eminent domain is not uh, a consideration of the plan. Um, and then the second question was a great question about kind of emergency situations. We have had conversations. Again, this is more of an operational conversation. It's not something that's relevant to the land use, um, but that is why we did um, write in considerations for accessory structures like sheds and things of that nature up on the elevated parkway because we did talk about there's a good chance that maybe um, there's kind of like a new approach to an emergency vehicle. We reference like a gator, if you're familiar with what that is, which is kind of like a souped up golf cart that you'd see like cart a football player off the field, for example, in a football game. Um, that something of that nature would likely need to be incorporated at the elevated level and kept there um, for access in, in cases of emergencies if someone's injured. Um, or has like a health episode to allow quick transport. So that will be a major consideration as, as we move into the design. We will be working very closely with the city's OEM um, and the police and the fire and the EMT branches to understand what they need to ensure that people up there will be safe, um, that when accidents do happen, that they have the accessibility they need between the street grade and the elevated parks. That will absolutely be a big consideration moving forward. And we do feel we've contemplated it in the way we need to as planners within the plan. Um, but again, more operational conversations to be had for sure through park design. Okay, so we're at 8.30. Um, sorry, we didn't get to everybody tonight, but please you know, shoot me emails. As I said, I really appreciate everyone hanging on for an extra 30 minutes who's still here. Um, it's great to see good attendance at these things and, and we really appreciate the public opinion here. Um, so like I said, I'm gonna just share my last slide one more time um, so that we can kind of uh, wrap up here and you get one last view of the upcoming dates. So thanks for joining all, we really appreciate it. Um, public comment period until 9.23, don't hesitate to reach out. Next milestone would be uh, next week's historic preservation meeting regarding just the block one Lewis Marin plan amendments, followed by um, planning board for that plan and then the embankment plan, which is the 
the focus really of what we discussed tonight moving forward in October. So we will shoot out emails with updates and all this. Like I said, um, look out for that in your inbox. Monday or very early next week um, is the goal right now. So thanks again for coming. We appreciate it. We hope you are excited about this moving forward. We know it's been a long time in the making. Um, you know, we're excited to take this step as city's planning and you know, moving the chains, as they say, and uh, one step closer. So thanks all, and we will see you soon. Have a great night. Thanks, Mallory. Thank you, Mallory. Good night. Good night.